What I want to do now, uh, just moving on from that, into the first part of this presentation, is to focus on some of the common themes and recurring elements which crop up time and time again in the backstory of the corporate music industry. And we're talking both the UK and the US industry, because a lot of the stuff, a lot of the key stuff that was happening in one country or the other was actually reflected on the opposite side of the Atlantic. So we can see the same agendas being rolled out in both the British and the American scene. And again, I would ask, could that be down to random chance and coincidence and just the way it goes? Or does this hint at a formulated plan which goes right back to the very early days of the industry and which was playing out according to blueprints that had been set into place? So going right back to the 1950s, basically, and drawing on quite an eclectic uh, array of resources, it became clear that there were some recurring elements that were popping up time and time again when you look at, look, you lift the veil of the music industry and see what lies beneath. Some of them include uh, trauma-based mind control, monarch programming, MK Ultra, and such, satanic ritual abuse, paedophilia, or to call it what it really is, child rape, you know, let's call a spade a spade, uh, dark occult ritualistic uh, ceremonies, a fascination with the occult teachings of Aleister Crowley and the various uh, secret societies that he was a part of. Uh, what else? Lots of sirs, never trust a sir, and lots of lords. Uh, when it comes to artists and those close to them, so that can be managers, loved ones, partners, a whole load of suicides and a whole load of accidental overdoses everywhere you look. Another factor in the British industry in the early days that cropped up time and time again was Jimmy Savile. A question which you might like to ask yourselves, which I ask at all my events, is what connection should there be between an industry that is supposed to be about entertainment, fun, forgetting all the stresses and strains of the working week and letting your hair down at the weekend and enjoying yourself and you know using your leisure time in a way that pleases you. What connection should there be between all of that and things like paedophilia, uh, dark occult, uh, Satanism and, and all this stuff? There shouldn't really be any connections that you would expect to find. And yet we find them time and time again. So Jimmy Savile, we all know about him. No need to recap on him. I have to recap for US audiences because they don't really know too much about him, but I don't think it's necessary to do that in the UK. But it turns out that Jimmy Savile was associated with all the big movers and shakers in the early days of the industry. So here he is with very young Cliff Richard. There may well be more to say about Cliff Richard in future talks. We'll have to see how things pan out. Uh, can't say too much at the moment, but I feel that uh, as the year progresses, there may be more content regarding Cliff Richard that I can get into these talks. So here he is with Jimmy Savile, and Savile seems to be hypnotising him. Another theme which will crop up throughout this presentation is the concept of the truth of a matter being placed right there in plain sight, right in front of your face for those with the eyes to see. I'm going to be getting more into why I feel that's being done in the second half. But the truth in plain sight is something that crops up time and time again as well. So here's Savile seemingly hypnotising Cliff Richard with a bloody pendulum. Here's Savile in rare dark hair mode with Paul McCartney. Or is it? We're not going there tonight. We're not doing Paul McCartney and we're not doing Flat Earth because we want to be out by 10 o'clock. <laughs> so this was on the launch of the Sgt Pepper album and there's uh, Savile with McCartney. So Savile was uh, closely associated with the Beatles. For a period, uh, he apparently went out on gigs with them and drove their van and humped their gear around. So he was basically a roadie for them for a, for a short period. So very closely involved with them. Here he is with Mick Jagger. So uh, connections between Savile and the Rolling Stones, 
Why would we be surprised? But this one does surprise people, particularly when I showed it in Free Your Mind in the US last month, because who knew that Savile even was in there with Elvis Presley? So a question that's been asked many times is, why does this sleazy, creepy, not particularly talented DJ keep cropping up with all these key movers and shakers, and why was he friends with senior politicians, and why was he mates with Prince Charles, and you know, this is the question that's been asked so many times over the years, and Savile is key to so much of this because of what he represented, and because of who he was doing the bidding for. So we're getting into the BBC, and Savile of course was very closely linked to the BBC, worked there for the best part of 50 years, and we hear that uh, many of the kids that he sexually abused, it actually happened on BBC premises, paid for, of course, by licence fee payers, but Director General after Director General after Director General after Director General, decade after decade after decade after decade after decade, apparently didn't know it was going on, so it just got missed. It's just one of those things. Uh, Savile was knighted by the Queen, uh, he joined Betty's Nonsense Club, you know, twice. Uh, but of course she didn't know anything about his background and uh, MI6 looked into it, but they, they couldn't find anything, you know, again and again and again and again and again with paedophile after paedophile after paedophile after sir after sir after sir. But it's just one of those things, nothing to worry about, you know. Just slip through the net. Uh, that statue, by the way, sits outside Broadcasting House in London, which is the BBC's iconic building. And it's said to be from a Shakespeare play, Ariel and Prospero is the name of it. And um, people that appreciate art such as this and the works of Shakespeare and stuff point to this type of sculpture and they say, oh, well, it's, you know, it's art and it's expressing this or whatever. But I kind of call it as I see it. And what I see is a male adult with a young uh, naked male child writhing against his crotch. And uh, given what we've come to understand about the true nature of the BBC and the stuff that goes on there and the people that they employ, it's kind of an interesting statue to have outside their building. So for many years, Savile was actually the public face of BBC's children in need, incredibly. So the annual money grab, where the BBC implores the public to please dig deep and give us your money because we don't have enough, uh, you've, we've got to help these poor kids in needy situations, you know, give whatever you can. And they actually put Savile out there saying, come on, you know, give us what, what money you can. And I can't help thinking that there would have been far fewer children in need if it hadn't been for the BBC. So the hypocrisy of them, first of all, having an annual money grab and saying, come on, we've got to help these poor kids, we care about them. And then putting a serial paedophile on display as the public face of this programme is monumentally taking the piss. It is placing the truth in plain sight, but it's also mocking the general public, who, until recent years, would have had no idea that all this stuff was going on. They really were blatantly mocking us with a very macabre, twisted sense of humour. Pudsey Bear is the emblem of the BBC's Children in Need, I've got a lot of stuff in the book about uh, symbolism, and particularly symbols that are employed to hint at the presence of mind control, trauma-based mind control, and satanic ritual abuse, generational satanic ritual abuse, where they take kids from specific bloodlines that are deemed important, and from a very age, they subject them to horrific traumas, which causes uh, the mind to disassociate from reality, and the different personalities that are created can then be programmed with different uh, personalities which are brought out at will. So again, there's more on how that all plays out in the book as well, which I don't really have time to get into now. But there are many symbols which pertain to the presence of this method of mind control. And one of them is a teddy bear. And it's often teddy bears that are pictured with broken limbs. So it could be an eye missing, it could be an arm, it could be a leg. You get the same thing with dolls, where you get dolls with broken arms. Same thing with shattered mirrors. And all of this is designed to uh, symbolise the shattered innocence of childhood that these subjects experience at the hands of you know, the perpetrators. So when you learn to spot all the signs and symbols, they kind of leap out at you when you see them. 
And one of them, as I said, is a teddy bear. Often teddy bears with eyes missing. And in this case, we've got one eye covered up, which also ties into some interesting symbology regarding little calling cards and little motifs that those that control these industries like to place in plain sight. Again, you see the covering of one eye all the time. So isn't it interesting that we have Pudsey Bear and part of the emblem is just that. And also, he's sitting inside a pyramid in the early version, which is another interesting symbol. So, Savile wasn't the only grotesque paedophile to have been wheeled out by BBC Children in Need. Uh, Gary Glitter here got in on the act, so they wheeled him out as well. There's sickening footage of uh, Gary Glitter guesting on one of Jimmy Savile's shows on the BBC where they're both sitting on a sofa and they're inviting kids up to come and sit on their knees. Here's Rolf Harris on stage with Pudsey Bear. And uh, there were many others as well. So uh, that's just connections into the BBC. Uh, ultimately, everything is connected, really. Uh, everything feeds into everything else and you just realise that it's a tapestry of information that overlaps and kind of coincides at every turn. And there's all these kind of synchronistic links between key players and prominent figures. So we're back to a young Cliff Richard. And one of his associates in his early days was this guy, Lord Boothby. I told you there'd be a few lords. Bob Boothby. Anyone that's seen the recent movie Legend about the Cray Twins, where Tom Hardy plays both brothers. Bob Boothby is portrayed in that movie in a not particularly flattering way. So uh, Cliff Richard, it's on public record that he was you know, associated with them. The nature of their relationship is open to debate, but you probably also heard that Cliff Richard has been implicated with the Elm Guest House in London, and his name appeared on a list of uh, famous celebrities that are said to have attended that particular place. So here are the Cray Twins. Uh, most folk in the US don't tend to know who these guys are either. They know all about the Manson murders, but they don't really know about the craze. So I usually spend a bit of time explaining the craze to an overseas audience. But uh, the official version that we have of the craze, or the Wikipedia version, is that they were these East End gangsters, and they were into various criminal activities, you know, running drugs and laundering money, and beating people up, and then ultimately murdering people. But there's another aspect to their activities which many researchers have uncovered, which you don't tend to hear about in official biographies and on Wikipedia. And this is the very strong suggestion that the Crays were actually involved in procuring children from care homes for use in these VIP elite paedophile rings. That was a part of their uh, service. And all the other criminal stuff was kind of a smokescreen to conceal this aspect of their activities. So uh, the Crays, it turns out, knew Cliff Richard, and the Crays were tied in with many prominent politicians of the day, and there's connections into the Rolling Stones and the Beatles. And again, you can ask yourself, why should this be? But as I say, there's overlapping kind of correlations everywhere. And some researchers have even speculated on whether the Cray twins could have been subjects of mind control themselves given that, particularly with Ronnie Cray, his mood would often change from peaceful and placid and urbane to violent and psychopathic at the drop of a hat, which is very endemic of the, the presence of mind control. And um, often in mind control experiments, twins are used and have been historically going right back to the Nazi doctor Joseph Mengele. And a lot of the experiments that he did in the concentration camps in the Second World War were on twins because he wanted to see whether the twins could dis disassociate and kind of take over each other's persona. So it's all deeply sick stuff, but twins were often favoured in mind control experiments, so it makes you wonder.